Hello, welcome to Capturing Christianity. My name is Cameron Bertuzzi, if you don't know that by now. Today I'm joined by Dr. William Lane Craig and Dr. David Baggett. We're talking about moral arguments, and in particular we're asking what is the best moral argument. In reality, what we're going to do is we're going to help you understand the broader dialectic of moral arguments. There's not just one version of a moral argument, there's many different versions. And so what we're going to do today is talk about those different versions and uh, yeah, just broaden your horizons with the moral argument. There's a lot more to the moral argument that you may not be aware of. So let me just quickly introduce my guest and then we'll get rolling here. Dr. William Lane Craig, if you don't know, is an American analytic philosopher and Christian theologian, apologist, and author. He's professor of philosophy at Houston Baptist University and research professor of philosophy at Talbot School of Theology. He also runs Reasonable Faith. That website, reasonablefaith.org, is linked in the description of this video. Dr. Baggett, Dr. David Baggett, is currently a professor of philosophy and director at the Center for Moral Apologetics at Houston Baptist University. With his co-author, Jerry Walls, Dr. Baggett authored Good God, The Theistic Foundations of Morality. In 2016, he published a sequel with Walls that critiques naturalistic ethics, God and Cosmos, Moral Truth and Human Meaning. And a third book in the series, The Moral Argument, A History, uh, that was published in 2019, chronicles the history of moral arguments for God's existence. Dr. Baggett, I understand that you have, uh, you're under contract for a fourth book. Oh, wow. That's right. We're working on a book defending moral realism, and we'll really be getting to writing in earnest on that this uh, summer. So looking forward to that. All right. With that, let's get into the topic for today's video, which is we're going to we're going to survey some of the different arguments, some of the different moral arguments uh, that have been offered over you know, centuries. So uh, why don't we start, uh, David, give us, because you just finished your book in 2019 on the history of the moral mm -hmm. argument. Maybe you'd be the, the person to go to here. When was the first one offered that you found in your research? Uh, yeah, well, uh, Dr. Craig himself uh, says something like the essential idea uh, of, of the moral argument, you can, you can trace all the way back to someone like Plato, actually. Uh, but in the Western... Uh, world, we typically tend to look at someone like Immanuel Kant as the uh, first really major moral apologist, but there were some precursors uh, to him, like uh, like Reed and uh, Locke and others. And But uh, Kant is often uh, thought of as like the most significant first major explicit moral apologist, uh, and then it goes on from, from there. Excellent. Well, why don't we talk about some of the different versions of the moral argument that have that have come up, and then we'll talk about some of the drawbacks, some of the benefits of of each of them. Uh, where should we? How should we begin here? I'm I'm okay with either one of you guys taking the lead at this point. Well, let me say that in my work, I have defended two versions of the argument. Um, the first is the deductive argument that I present in my debate with the humanist philosopher Paul Kurtz uh, at Franklin and Marshall College on the topic, is goodness without God good enough? And that's the traditional way that I give the argument. Uh, premise one would be if God does not exist, then objective moral values and duties do not exist. And here I appeal to the atheistic tradition of thinkers like Nietzsche, Russell, and Sartre. Uh, and then the second premise is that objective moral values and duties do exist, uh, appealing to our moral experience of values and moral obligations, from which it then follows logically that God exists. And I like this deductive formulation of the argument because it's so simple. It's so clear that it's easy for audiences to grasp when they hear it orally. The other version of the argument that I've presented is the one inspired by Dave Baggett's work, which is uh, an inference to the best explanation. And I used this version of the argument in my more recent debate with Eric Wielenberg at North Carolina State uh, on is the foundation of moral values uh, supernatural or natural? And in this version of the argument, one takes it for granted that 
objective moral values and duties do exist. This is a given. And this version was particularly appropriate with Eric Wielenberg, because even though Wielenberg is a naturalist, he is uh, firmly committed to the objectivity of moral values and duties. And so the question that faced us was not our moral values and duties objective, but rather, what's the best explanation? And so I argued for the superiority of a theistic grounding for values and duties, as opposed to Wielenberg's theory called uh, normative atheistic realism. Um, and so those would be two versions of the argument that I have myself defended. Um, but Dave knows vastly more about this subject than I do. Uh, it's a privilege to be on this podcast with someone who I think probably knows more about the moral argument than anybody else alive. And well, so Dr. Craig, hand it over to him. <laughs> I didn't want to make you feel bad. I was going to say, David is probably the, four, the world's foremost expert on the moral argument. And he He's shaking his head here because he's so humble. But this is... This I, mean, is I just can't believe... I can't believe, Dave, that you've written a tetralogy on this. I mean, that's a, that's a monumental achievement. Uh, well, I appreciate it. Jer Jerry and I have had a, had a lot of fun with the project. And um, there's just so much uh, richness to, to explore with this stuff, you know? I mean, it really is just such a wonderful topic. Uh, thanks for all those compliments, and thanks, of course, for inordinately elevating expectations so that I can make them all come to fresh <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, uh, it, uh, it's a privilege for me to be to be here with you guys. So, uh, yeah, so if, if I could uh, continue on then with what Dr. Craig was talking about, I think uh, Dr. Craig has done more than just about anybody uh, drawing attention to moral apologetics and, and the moral argument and uh, I know it's not uh, necessarily your favorite argument, Dr. Craig. I think that's the cosmological argument, probably. That's the one that you've really uh, devoted so much to. But you have said, interestingly, that when you've gone to college campuses, uh, it's the moral argument often that's the, the most effective yeah. at persuasion. I, I find that fascinating. Yeah, so. Yeah, that's yeah, exactly I, right, Dave. It's, it's the one that students really connect with yeah. uh, because, as I've said, you can get away with denying that the universe began to exist. This isn't going to affect your life. But every day you get up, you answer the question, do other people have intrinsic moral worth by how you behave, how you treat others? So this is an argument that is existentially unavoidable and therefore very powerful. Yeah, that's exactly how I see it. I, and I think it's one of the reasons why it's uh, particularly well uh, suited to serve as a, as a prelude for a proclamation of the Christian gospel. I mean, it gets you right there, that there is this standard of which we all fall short, and then something has to be uh, put, put into place to address that. We need forgiveness, we need transformation, you know, and ultimately if there's anything like uh, hope for, uh, you know, complete transformation, uh, we, need, we need the worldview resources to make sense of those things. So, yeah. Well, I love the moral argument. And by the way, uh, it's, a, it's a big reason why I'm here at, at Houston Baptist. Uh, some years ago, I wrote the president here, Dr. Robert Sloan, about the possibility of starting uh, the Center for Moral Apologetics that Cameron mentioned. And the idea was to have a, a place carved out at, at a university like this one uh, that could become sort of the hub of cutting edge work and, and research on various aspects of the moral argument. And it really is a job for a community and not just a, a single person or, or two. There's so much, uh, so much great work to be done. And we thought this would be an ideal place to do it. Very exciting things were already happening here with, with apologetics. And uh, Dr. Sloan was excited when he heard about the center and said he'd really like to do it here as soon as it became practicable. And then this last summer, it, it finally uh, happened. So very, very happy to be here. Also, by the way, in conjunction with the center that we're starting here, guys, uh, there's going to be a certificate in moral apologetics offered starting summer after this one. 
uh, where it'll be two courses one summer and then two courses the next summer. And uh, we'll really have an opportunity uh, to, to delve into the intricacies and various facets of, of moral apologetics. So we're really looking forward to it. Wow. So why don't we build out the case or look at some of the, the other, I think in what you do, because you, you've already, Dr. Craig, you've already kind of talked about the, there's the deductive form of the argument where you've got the conditional premise. Uh, if God does not exist, then moral values and duties don't exist, uh, but they do exist. So therefore God exists. That's the deductive form of the argument. But then uh, David, he, he's, he's very, very uh, fond of the abductive version, which says that God is the best explanation of various moral phenomena. Is that the, the term that you would use? Yeah. So, yeah, so that second uh, version of the moral argument that uh, Dr. Craig has advanced, the abductive version, and I loved how he, uh, you used, I loved how you used that with uh, D Dr. Wielenberg, uh, Dr. Craig. Mm -hmm. I thought that was uh, marvelous and it was uh, brilliant and uh, just a really, really neat uh, thing to see. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, the, the deductive version is, I agree, it, it, it's powerful, it's uh, succinct, it's pithy. I mean, you know, you can uh, commit it to memory, you can have it good to go. And in a debate setting, oftentimes it's the best way to go, probably, because of time constraints and, and all of that. Yeah. And you have a, you know, you have a deductively valid argument, so there's no, nothing uh, questionable about that. And then it just becomes a matter of defending the premises. It's, it's, it's brilliant. And like I say, I think it's... Uh, done as much as anything or anyone to really uh, draw people's attention to the moral arguments. I have just such great respect for you and appreciation for you along those lines. The, uh, yeah, the abductive approach is just uh, another way to kind of uh, couch or formulate uh, the argument. And this is one way in which, by the way, I think we can point to diversity among moral arguments. And there'll be another way I'll get to in a, in a moment. But this is in terms of the logical structure. You can use a, a deductive version uh, like Dr. Craig's. Uh, you can also twirl it around and, and put it into a modus ponens form if you want uh, to, and that would be a, a rather uh, a rather similar logical kind of approach that would have a lot of potential. Uh, but then there's an abductive uh, approach. And I'm going to tell you something, Dr. Craig, I've never told you before. Do you know who got me excited about abduction years ago? It was you. No. I oh. Yes. <laughs> You you gave a podcast on the resurrection and you laid it out using uh, abductive wow. terms, and it was a thing of beauty. I was mesmerized, wow. and after that, I uh, I myself started to think uh, about the moral argument in, in those uh, in those terms, and it's always funny to me because some of my students uh, think that you know uh, they'll say, uh, "Well, you like the abductive version." But I like Dr. Craig, and he likes the deductive oh. version, so I like the deductive version better, <laughs> which I completely respect. Um, <laughs> but, but of course, these things aren't in competition at, at all, and no. a lot depends on the, right, the context to, uh, that you find yourself mm. in and the particular right. people with whom you're having the conversation and so forth. But yeah, in an abductive approach, Cameron... You, you start, say, say with the objective moral values and duties, that's a great place to start. And you might just choose one or the other, objective moral values or objective moral uh, duties, uh, or both. Um, and there are other possibilities too, and that gets to that second point that I said I'll, I'll bring up in, in another second, so let me hold off on that. But then you, you start with that as sort of axiomatic, right? And so if you're having a conversation with someone uh, with whom those sorts of notions resonate and come alive and speak to those uh, people, then you can initiate a conversation about, well, what is it that we need to uh, really explain these things in a, in a robust sort of way, right? And ultimately, you want to answer the question, you know, what's the best explanation? But you can even just start with, well, what, what is needed for a good explanation, a decent explanation, a robust explanation in the first place, and then kind of inch your way toward that ultimate conclusion. But you don't have to be in any rush. And by the way, I think with respect to the uh, evidence being considered, say, like objective moral values and duties, it does great good in these conversations uh, with our interlocutors to spend time talking about exactly what it is that we mean by these things. Uh, and then yeah. if you don't do that, you know, that one of the dangers that you're susceptible to is 
uh, reinforcing the idea with uh, whoever it is you're talking with that they can just think about it for a second, get a beat on it, and and then start talking about it authoritatively without really having come to terms with the nature of the evidence. One of the things that I saw when I did the uh, history of the moral argument uh, was that these were folks, for the most part, by Sorley and A.E. Taylor and John Henry Newman and all these various guys, they spent a lifetime considering the moral evidence in, in great detail. They really lived with you know, these arguments and these ideas. And there really is a lifetime, if not in, uh, in eternity, for us to ponder these ideas. They're very rich concepts. Ultimately, uh, you know, it's nothing less than the very character of God. So uh, get people to be attentive to the evidence, I always suggest. Uh, and that, that will at least help them perhaps uh, shy away from the knee-jerk kind of deflationary analyses that ex explains away these concepts as well as it explains them. Uh, so, so you start with something like objective moral values and duties, and then you know you have uh, principled reasons to identify uh, what constitutes a good explanation, right? So, how ma how many of these phenomena are explained? How well are they, are they explained? How well do the explanations cohere with our background assumptions? And how uh, ad hoc are the explanations? Of course, the less ad hoc, the better, and so forth and so on. You know, the standard criteria for assessing the quality of these sorts of arguments. And then, and then you argue that a theistic explanation in various respects can better explain, more deeply explain uh, the, 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 the existence and the nature of such things as objective moral values and duties. So, so for example, with uh, duties, there's a kind of authority that most of us are inclined to think that moral obligations uh, possess. Where does that authority come from? We can adduce, say, instrumental reasons to perform a particular behavior or to refrain from per performing a particular behavior. We can do that all the day long. We haven't yet accounted for any kind of deep sense of authority. So if authority is indeed a salient feature of moral duties, then we need to spend time laying that out, making it clear that's what's in need of explanation, not slapping the word duty on something and saying, there you go, I've just explained it. You know, I use it in that way. And other people agree with me. What's the challenge? You're only going to feel the force of the argument if you spend enough time really uh, with, with the evidence and allowing it to work on you. By the way, one last image I'll, I'll share. My friend uh, Jonathan Pruitt, he's my managing editor at moralapologetics.com and a great guy. But he says sometimes, yeah, the moral argument that you that you give, it, it was kind of like a, a snake. And at uh, first, it kind of gradually kind of wound its way around me. And then then it started to tighten. And, and then over <laughs> more time, it tightened some more <laughs> and some more. But, but he lived with the argument, you see. He did exactly the kind of thing that we're hoping to do at the center at uh, Houston Baptist, uh, inviting people in to work together and collaboratively to live with these arguments and really uh, probe in depth the richness of these topics. What really opened my mind to the abductive form of the argument and, and this, this the value of it, I was listening to, it was a podcast that you've, that you've got, speaking of moralapologetics.com, you guys have a podcast that's excellent. I doubt that you had this pod, I forget what the name of it was, but I think it was something like Four, I don't know, four things that the, I don't know, there's, there's different aspects of morality uh, beyond just moral values and duties, which is the formulation that I think most people are familiar with or the moral data that most people are familiar with when we're thinking of a moral argument is moral values and duties. But in this talk, in this podcast, you referenced other things like moral transformation and uh, there's, there's other moral phenomena that is in need of explanation, not just moral duties or moral values. And that to me just kind of blew my mind. It opened me up to really appreciating the fact that there's other things about morality that could potentially point to the existence of God. So that that was a, a whole buildup to this question that I've got for you, David, is what is your favorite aspect or what which aspect of morality do you think most clearly points to the existence of God or is best explained by theism? Yeah, that, that's very tricky, uh, you know, because I, 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 and maybe I'm wrong, but I, I can't help but but see all of the various disparate parts um, working together in, in tandem, and and, and so um, 
I, I, I kind of want to say it's the cumulative effect of all of these things. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I don't know if that's a, a cheat. <laughs> I don't know if I'm being uncooperative in answering the question that way. <laughs> um, but, but, but I really mean it. You know, for example, uh, uh, Dr. Craig mentioned, like, the, the, say, the intrinsic value of persons. Uh, to me, that this is a, a really powerful aspect of the values discussion and, and something that I, I really think does point to God's existence. Uh, you know how there are different approaches. So, so you know, you're presuppositionless. That's kind of like deductivism on steroids. It's, it seems to me like this it absolutely <laughs> entails this. You know, <laughs> you can't help but get to the. You know, maybe they're right for all I know, but I I, I don't find it personally dialogically to, <laughs> to be the best approach. But and then you can try to, a, a more deductive approach and just say, well, you know, like the 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 uh, the only real explanation here is something like, like like this. Really, I mean, if you if you think about it, like theism. And then an, an abductive approach, uh, but you also have something you might say that's even less ambitious, like uh, like C, uh, Steve Evans talks about natural signs, and the intrinsic value of persons is one of the things that he points to as a natural sign, which he says doesn't entail God's existence, but it sort of gestures toward it, you know, and it's potentially uh, potentially in principle open to various defeaters. So you know you have to have these discussions, uh, but but it, it gestures in the direction toward God. The reason why I, 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 I'm drawn to even something like, like that as, as, as a plea to something like a, a strong entailment notion is because that what that enables you to do is say, okay, just like in classical apologetics, uh, you, you can consider the teleological argument, maybe the ontological argument and the cosmological argument, the moral argument and, and other arguments and put them all together into a cumulative case that's stronger right, than any of the individual parts. In a similar sort of way, it seems to me, with respect to morality, you can construct a cumulative moral argument, you see? Hmm. And that's what, I, that's what I aim to do. So uh, I kind of start with Dr. Craig starts. Uh, I think that's, uh, in terms of metaphysics, I, I think that's really the, the key place to start. What are these key moral phenomena, key moral facts in need of robust explanation? Objective moral values and duties is, a, is an impeccable way to capture that notion. So I often will start uh, start there. And then if you wish to extend the discussion, and of course, depending on who you're talking to, uh, there are different ways ways to do this. And by the way, this pertains to that second point from earlier that I promised, so now I'm there. Uh, you could also talk about, say, moral rights. Where do those come from? And of course, they're probably very closely linked with uh, objective moral duties, aren't they? You could talk about another metaphysical uh, issue of moral freedom, right? The requisite freedom that we require as human beings to make culpable decisions. Uh, and what's going to best account for that? A theistic picture or say a, a physicalist or mechanistic picture of, of human beings. Um, you could talk about moral regrets like uh, William James uh, does and how they don't really fit very well into a naturalistic uh, picture, right? You can talk about moral knowledge and there are examples of uh, epistemic moral arguments that various people give, like Angus Mnuchin, Angus Ritchie, and um, others. Um, Richard Swinburne, even, who, who's often skeptical about moral arguments, but that, that, that version of the argument he likes. Uh, and then, of course, you can also talk about yet other aspects of morality, like the rationality of morality. If ultimately the happy aren't the holy, right, there's a fundamental disconnect between rationality and morality. And Christianity offers an impeccable explanation of why ultimately there is not such a, a, a dichotomy or, or a disconnect. And that's a, a marvelous thing because, you know, Sidgwick, who himself wasn't convinced uh, that, that God exists, but recognized in what he called the dualism of practical reason, the challenge associated if there isn't ultimate correspondence between happiness and holiness. And of course, of course, Immanuel Kant, this is a major version of his, yeah. of his uh, one of his versions of the. Uh, uh, moral argument. And, and then finally, the, the issue of is holiness even achievable? You know, can the moral life actually be lived? And, and this is another Kantian theme. And, and of course, it's very much connected with that axiomatic deontic principle of ought implies can. And uh, if it's the case that morality ultimately is simply beyond us, how can we say that we ought to live morally? And Christianity's answer again, and this is following someone like, say, Yale's John Hare, 
right, offers this, this wonderful sort of answer. Yes, ought implies can, but part of that picture is with God's assistance. On our own, we can't live up to the moral law, but by God's grace, we can. So by God's grace, we can be forgiven, and we can be changed, and ultimately completely transformed and delivered from the power of sin altogether, entirely conformed to the image of Christ and all, and all the rest. So what you have is this really rich, cumulative uh, picture, it seems to me, Cameron, right? We have access to all of these things, intrinsic human value, authoritative moral obligations, the ra full rationality of, of morality, um, you know, an account of how it is that these deep existential moral needs of ours can be met to be forgiven, to be changed, to be uh, perfected. What you, what you have ultimately in a theistic picture is a robust account of all of these things. And what, what you can do is say the cumulative effect of them all is powerful. So if I were to answer that question, what's the best moral argument? I'd probably say something like that. You know, it, it's a cumulative moral argument that doesn't have to pick and choose between these uh, different parts. They're so organically connected that there's something so almost artificial to, to wrench them apart anyway. It seems hmm. to me that we don't have to pick and choose in that in that way. We've got access to the to the whole of them. So wow. first, for, yeah, first thing that I want to say is that was awesome. Second thing I want to say <laughs> is I think that was I think this is a this is a very good uh, promo for this class. If you want to get more in depth into the moral argument. I assume that you're going to go in depth into all of these different aspects of morality and the various ways that they can point to the existence of God. So if you want to learn more, that's the way to do it. Cause we only have got uh, 30 minutes left here uh, and we'll only get, you know, as far as we can. So uh, yeah. So if you're interested and you want to get deeper then then check out the class. But so that's the, that's the second thing. Third thing is Dr. Craig, what are you, what, what is your, uh, what are your thoughts on what he just said? Well, I liked his appeal to the Kantian argument that in order to proportion uh, happiness to morality, you need God as a guarantor of immortality uh, and life beyond the grave. Because if life ends at the grave, as it does on atheism, then happiness and and uh, morality are not proportioned to each other. The the righteous often die young and miserably. So that argument, I think, is really worth emphasizing. And then uh, Dave also mentioned an argument from moral knowledge. This is the argument that Mark Linville presses in the Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology. When I invited Mark to contribute a moral argument for God's existence, I was expecting something more along the lines of the argument that I was familiar with. But instead, he offered a kind of evolutionary argument uh, in favor of um, theistic ethics, uh, namely that if our uh, cognitive faculties are simply the product of blind naturalistic causes, then they have been selected for their survival value. Our beliefs have been selected for their survival value and not for their truth. And that makes it very, very improbable that our moral beliefs in particular would be reliable. Even if moral values exist, they would be some sort of causally unconnected abstract objects, um, not in time and space, and they would have no influence upon us. And so how extraordinary it would, it would be if just that sort of creature emerged from the blind evolutionary process who had access accurately to this moral realm, including what duties and prohibitions uh, he should have. And so I think that's a really powerful argument in favor of theism, which says that our cognitive faculties have been crafted by God in such a way that we can access these moral truths. Yeah, and I really agree. Uh, Mark Linville has done such uh, tremendous work. Uh, I, I uh, love Mark's work. I've been telling him for years that he he's the guy to write the definitive book on the, on the moral argument. I think he's he's the man. Mm. Uh, yeah, he's he's marvelous, and uh, everybody should look up his work. And you can even find that uh, that particular piece uh, 
Dr. Craig was referring to, if you just Google the moral argument, Mark Linville, you can actually find it right on the internet. Uh, it's very easily accessible, well worth reading. And that's exactly the kind of thing, that, yeah, that we wanna do in this class and then in, in the upcoming certificate program, we want to give people a chance to really delve into these rich materials like this and to do it in community and together, whether we're you know together in person or, or not, uh, with technology, we can connect all, all around the world and really build a vibrant, dynamic community that uh, devotes itself, you know, to uh, using these re resources to become equipped to do our evangelism, to do our outreach, our apologetics uh, better. So I have one question and then we're going to turn to some audience Q&A. We've already got uh, one super chat in. We'll get to that in just uh, a few minutes here. The question is, it's related to someone that you brought up, David, when you were talking, Richard Swinburne. A lot of atheists, uh, people who reject the moral argument or atheists who, who at least do so, they reject it. Uh, sometimes they'll, they'll refer to Christian philosophers who reject the moral argument like Richard Swinburne. So what is what is his objection to the moral argument? And I know you mentioned that he actually favors a moral uh, an argument for moral knowledge, uh, which is yeah. I think goes to your point about the the cumulative case being the case that you wanted that you want to bring. Uh, but what is yeah. his objection, and why do people find it persuasive? Well, probably because uh, Swinburne is a genius. <laughs> and we all recognize that. And uh, you think, man, I don't want to disagree with Richard Swinburne. <laughs> Mark, Mark Foreman and I, some years ago, to the EPS picked him up uh, from the airport. And uh, we, you know, we, we drove uh, to, to the conference. And, uh, and I was pummeling him with questions about the moral argument, you know. And, and you know, by the time he gets done explaining it, I mean, I, I, in my head, I, I kept thinking, well, surely I, I disagree with everything uh, that he's saying on this. But then you hear that accent and everything, and you think, oh, I'm out loud. I, I've got to be wrong. I, how could I possibly be right? So it's the accent. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Uh, so in, his book, in his book, The Existence of God, which I, I just recently uh, reread, yeah, he's got a chapter on um, the moral argument and arguments from con uh, consciousness. And so that's where people can find it. That's on page 192 of this, of this uh, version. You know, in anticipation of your asking about Swinburne, I actually reread this uh, this morning. And, uh, hmm. you know, for the life of me, I'm, I'm completely drawing a blank uh, now, you know, uh, as to as to what his argument is. I, I think he, he finds it the ontological version uh, kind of unpersuasive. And I think it's largely connected with his idea that the the necessary truths of morality, if, if such there be, uh, don't admit of ultimate explanations, right. uh, necessary, right? Yeah, so, it, and it's probably connected in that sense with uh, Dr. Craig's work, you know, on uh, Platonism, right? It's this mm. notion that if there are these necessary truths, then they possess something like a saity or they exist a say, and thus are in no need of uh, any anything more ultimate by way of an explanation, uh, and then, but there's a few, there are a few ways in which you can go, go, uh, go about addressing this. Dr. Craig's is one where he wants to say, well, look, I, you don't necessarily have to affirm these truths as abstract truths. You can root them in something more concrete, like the, like the nature of God or, or something like that. I don't, I don't mean to um, speak for you, Dr. Craig, but something along those lines. And then of course you have the theistic activist approaches, which is another sort of uh, attempt to say, well, no, there are these abstract truths, but you know, maybe, um, uh, there's good reason to think that they are, uh, you know, thoughts in God's mind or something like that, and thus sustained by God's noetic activity or, or some such thing as that. Personally, as a theist, I I find implausible the notion that that there would be these necessary truths that exist independently of of God. To me, that just sort of grates against my sensibilities as a, as a, something of a classical theist or probably a theistic personalist. Um, so, so, so I'm unmoved by uh, what convinces Swinburne, uh, and we wrote about this at some length, and Dr. Craig has written about it in various places uh, at greater length, uh, in, in in various places. Um, I we dealt with it, for example, in in the Good God. Uh, that, so, so that was way back when I was uh, pondering such things as 
Morris and Menzel and Planiga's uh, How to Be an Anti-Realist uh, and all of that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't thought about it in more more recent years, but I was reminded all of all of that when I looked at uh, Swinburne's stuff more more recently. I think Wielenberg... If I could say... Go ahead. If I could say very quickly, just two points. I think that Richard Swinburne assumes uncritically that there cannot be explanations for necessary truths. <laughs> and I think that's not only false, uh, I think someone like Robert Adams has just exploded that notion that certainly necessary truths can stand in relations of explanatory priority to one another. The second reason I think that Swinburne cannot root morality in God is because he believes that God is a contingent object, whereas some moral truths are necessary, as Dave said. Richard Swinburne has this very peculiar idea that does not exist in every possible world, that God is contingent. And so given that conception of God, it, it rules out grounding any sort of necessary truths in God. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. Um, he, he, he'll, he'll often refer to in sanguine fashion, well, these things exist in every possible world and whatnot, whether God exists in those worlds or not. And, and, and that sort of language, I think, bespeaks a, a problem. Uh, yeah, because if you think that, uh, and there are good principle reasons to believe that God's existence is necessary, then there is no world in which God does not exist. If you're just sort of casually throwing it out there and saying, well, you've got this necessary truth, but it can exist in a world in which God doesn't, well, your job is done. I just don't think that argument works. Yeah, I think that's that's exactly right. But he does have the accent going for him, Dr. Craig. You've got to you've got right, to There's do no that. denying that. There's no denying <laughs> that, Dave. On that note, I've actually interviewed him in person, and it was the most intimidating experience of my life, it, interviewing him in person. And it wasn't because he was trying to be intimidating. It was just, yeah. he's so the brilliant. Accent. He's so, it's the accent. It's the accent. <laughs> yeah, he's very sharp. He's very sharp. He's so, he's so sharp. Okay, well, let's get to some audience Q&A. So I've got a question that's already been pulled in. Uh, or, or thrown in earlier. So let me go ahead and pull it up on the screen. You guys will be able to read it as well, um, but I'll read it out loud for the audience. This one is for Dr. Craig. Moral dilemmas occur here on Earth, so they must ultimately be discussed, debated, and solved by subjective human minds. Does that not make God, the objective moral source, irrelevant regardless of his existence? I don't think so. I think this question, once again makes the familiar confusion between moral epistemology and moral ontology. The claim that there are objective moral values and duties is not the claim that everything is black and white and easy to discern. Of course, there are areas of gray where it's very difficult to discern what our moral duty is in some situation. And there we're going to be uh, having to debate and discuss and, and wrestle with this to try to determine our duties. So the claim that there is an objective right and wrong uh, for you to do in a moral situation is not to say that this is easy to discern or clear. So don't think that the fact that moral epistemology is something that is sometimes ambiguous, unclear, uh, vague, means that there is no objective truth that we're trying to get at. And if I might add, yeah, exactly along those lines, this actually helps address an objection that some people have to theistic ethics in general, which is, yeah, but if you think that morality is rooted in God, ultimately, then this just entails that you turn your brain off and you consult the rule <laughs> book and see what God has to say, and that's the end of the matter. When in point of fact, of course, say, uh, say, say you take a scripture authoritatively, we all know that the process of act exegetical analysis can be very difficult. You have to take into account all, all manner of, you know, uh, considerations of culture and, and context and uh, word studies and, and whatnot. Or take the, the idea that God gives us a principle, a general principle. Okay, but how does that general principle apply to specific situations? 
that that can be hard work to figure that out. And sometimes even there might be legitimate disagreement, right, uh, be, between uh, uh, equally professing uh, believers uh, who who think hard about it and might not always see entirely eye to eye. And that's part of the challenge of learning to love your neighbors yourself, even when we might uh, not always see uh, in, in you know exact things in exactly the same way. So all of that to say. Yeah, to be a theistic ethicist in the right sort of way is anything but uh, turning off your brain. So here's uh, just a comment, a funny comment from Roger Sharp. He says, the best moral argument, speak with an accent. <laughs> That's right, Rog. <laughs> Roger's say hi, Say hi to Mary Jo for both of us. Yes. All right, we just got another super chat in from Maverick Christian. And uh, let me go ahead and read this one out again. You guys, you be able to read it on the screen as well. On the deductive moral argument, I found that some atheists in practice redefine morality so that moral oughts are descriptive. For example, hypothetical oughts, mm -hmm. removing the need for God. Have you found this to be the case? Well, I found this to be the case, particularly with Sam Harris in the debate that I had with him on the foundation of moral values at the University of Notre Dame. What he kept doing was offering sort of um, hypothetical moral duties. For example, if you want to promote the flourishing of sentient life, then you ought to do this and that. And it's no part of uh, theistic ethics to deny those sorts of hypothetical judgments. For example, if you want corn to flourish, then you ought to fertilize it and rotate your crops every year. Those kinds of conditional uh, oughts or obligations are not what we're talking about with regard to moral obligations, which are categorical. That is to say, they're not conditional in that way. Yeah. And, uh, and this applies to any version of the argument that you want to talk about, the deductive, the inductive, the abductive, uh, Evans's approach, and whatever else. This goes back to the, the vital importance of close attentiveness to the moral e evidence. Uh, yeah, again, because if, you, if you're not being sufficiently attentive, you might think that you're, we're talking about the same thing, but you're actually cashing out the significance of moral duties in purely instrumental terms or what, what have you. There's also, by the way, I, I think you'd agree, Dr. Craig, often in someone like Sam, a confusion of moral and non-moral goods, right? Yeah. So oftentimes, yeah, yeah, he'll just talk about, you know, uh, you know human flourishing or, or some such thing, and then... Uh, you know, cash cash out what what is good for us in, in terms like those, but of course, morality yeah is fundamentally uh, prescriptive. It's it's normative. It's not merely a de descriptive, and there are distinctively moral goods. Uh, so uh, we we neglect this to our peril in our analysis, and it lends itself, it seems to me, to these deflationary analyses that rather than explaining moral facts ro robustly. Uh, settles for, for something distinctly watered down. But I think it's just a function of not being sufficiently attentive to the evidence. Yeah. yeah, this is important too with respect to what Dave said earlier about defining key moral terms and understanding moral concepts. Because a concept like goodness, for example, is used equivocally in a lot of yeah. non-moral senses. For example, uh, Baylor has a good basketball team. You're not talking about the ethics of the team members when you say that, or you say uh, chess is a good game. Again, that's not an ethical use of good, or right. this is a good rule to follow. Um, there, you, you've got to make sure that you've got your handle on moral concepts and not uh, cheap substitutes for them. That's right. Wasn't it Chesterton who said you could be a good uh, shot and, and uh, be able to shoot your grandmother, but it doesn't make it be a good shot, but, but uh, not be a good man? A good so shot. we've got yeah. we, we've got a few more questions that have come in. We'll try to get to as many as we can. Jonathan Pruitt, who I'm sure you you've heard of him, uh, his, he I says, Dr. Baggett. Really. Yeah. Dr. Baggett, what web resources do you recommend on the moral <laughs> argument? Well, Jonathan, uh, <laughs> managing editor of moralapologetics.com, as it happens, your very website, moralapologetics.com, 
uh, is is quite a good resource. Um, <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure there are others, but that's the only one I want to talk about at the moment. Well, of course, <laughs> there's so much there's so much over at uh, Dr. Craig's site. So. Uh, yeah. And also on capturing Christianity. All right, here we go. Russell Jones. Ah, capturing Christianity. Okay. Uh, Russell Jones, he's one of our supporters. He says, do either of you find moral obligations are more difficult to explain on naturalism than values? That is to say, it is one thing if an abstract moral value exists and quite another that it is binding. Yes, this is one of the objections that I raise against atheistic moral Platonism, as I call it. Even if you have platonic abstract objects like the good or justice or loyalty or courage, um, that leaves completely unaddressed the question, what obligates me to be just or to be courageous or loyal? Uh, presumably on this view, there are moral vices that exist as abstract objects like lethargy and cruelty. So why am I obligated to align my life with one set of these abstract objects rather than another? I think it's very difficult to give an account of duties apart from uh, moral imperatives by a qualified authority, as Dave said. Now, interestingly, the way the question is worded uh, sort of intimates that it might be more difficult to explain the moral duties. And uh, Dr. Craig's point, uh, which I think is, a, is an excellent one, is, is suggesting that actually, uh, actually, uh, there, you know, there are these powerful theistic resources we have to make full sense of robust m moral duties. And, and in that sense, uh, it, it might be less difficult rather than more difficult to explain them on theism. Uh, but yeah, I, I agree with all that stuff. All right, here's a question from Chad McIntosh. He was recently on our channel. He's a uh, philosopher and he joined me for a four and a half hour stream where we outlined 155 arguments for God's existence. Wow. And these are all peer reviewed arguments. And so we provide a resources. He's, he's awesome. All right. Here's his question. What are Baggett's and Craig's thoughts on Newman's argument from conscience? Thanks for the great work and show. Can I take this one? Uh, yes. So, yeah, yeah, I love John Henry Newman's work. And uh, so, uh, uh, Grammar of Ascent, uh, I would encourage everybody to read it, especially chapters five and 10. And that's where you're going to find his uh, his distinctive uh, version of the, of the moral argument. Yeah, he, and, and uh, you know, he, he, what he wants to say is uh, that there's, there's good reason to believe that when our conscience is speaking to us, uh, and it's and it's it, you know genuinely our conscience properly uh, functioning. It's nothing less than the the voice of God that's speaking to us. And what this enables, he thinks, is not merely a propositional argument to believe that God exists. It actually gives us an opportunity to know God because it, there is direct experience of God Himself in, in in that. He calls conscience the vicar of Christ and and things like this. And there are numerous uh, features of, of Newman's approach that I find um, endlessly fascinating and marvelously perspicacious. And um, whenever I brag about uh, John Henry Newman, uh, Jerry Walls uh, winces, you know, because he's less a fan of uh, some of that. But um, that the, the expanse of epistemology, for example, that you find in, in Newman is, is just tremendous. Uh, he was such a, a student of uh, of epistemology, and he recognized, for example, that when we make a decision, it's typically not because of, you know, one simple syllogism that has convinced us, you know, usually there are a thousand factors at play, and, and they're all kind of working on us in, in various and sundry ways, and, uh, you know, eventually we find ourselves being convinced by something. Uh, right, whether whether you know, our uh, conviction that, that uh, God exists or that there is objective morality or or what have you, but he his his whole approach is very true to the complexity of epistemology uh, and of the human condition along those lines, and I, I find his his work just really wonderful along along those lines. So I encourage you all to read it. I, I think his work on conscience, along with uh, Along with A.E. Taylor's work on conscience, if you get get a chance to uh, read that, it's so so worth reading. Faith of a Moralist by A.E. Taylor. By the way, those two works, uh, Grammar of Ascent 
and Faith of a Moralist are the two classics that H.P. Owen in the 1960s, when he published his book on the moral argument, said these are the two most important. Uh, I mean, even more mm. than Kant, he thought. Uh, A.E. Taylor's mm. Faith of a Moralist, uh, John Henry Newman's Grammar of Ascent. And if you sign up with the certificate program at HBU here, <laughs> you're going to have an opportunity to read classics like that. Uh, in community, and that's going to be a lot of fun. So wow. I'm sure to do that. So here's our last question uh, that we'll discuss today, and then we'll close it out. From Robert Noss Worthington. Is there a plausible non-theistic explanation for moral duties? You want to take that, Dr. Craig? Well, the best I thought I've heard was Eric Wielenberg's normative uh, atheistic realism but in the end, I, I, I argued, and I, I think it's correct to say that it's not plausible in giving us categorical duties to fulfill. So I think that this project is not one that the naturalist can, can manage. What, what do you think, Dave? Yeah, so the word plausible is key, right? So uh, yes. Are there, are there pos possible non-theistic explanations, at least epistemically possible? Sure. Yeah. Are, and are there some, on the assumption that this is an atheistic world, that would carry some measure of plausibility? I, I, it seems to me that that there are principled reasons for theists to think the answer to that question is, is yes, and I'll tell you why, but then I'll tell you why I think that they're still inadequate. Right? So if we're right as, as theists, then... Uh, this world exists only because God created it, and it's inhabited by creatures like us who are eternal creatures made in God's image. So when we say to an atheist, hey, knock yourself out, use the resources of this world to construct your moral theory, I don't think they're going to be without resources to come up with some stuff, right? They have a world, right, inhabited by eternal creatures made in God's image, and, you know, and, and a world that is sustained in its existence by, by God wouldn't otherwise be able even so much to exist it would almost be shocking if they couldn't come up with with some measure of plausible explanations of certain aspects of morality. But you see, as an abductivist, uh, I, I'm inclined to say, but that's all perfectly consistent with a good uh, moral argument for God's existence, because what we can say is the issue is, is, is not, are you implicated in a logical contradiction with every one of your views as a secularist and you're laying out an ethical theory or anything of the kind, Rather, what's the better explanation? What's the best explanation? So they come up with their explanations by appeal to what resources they have at, our, at their disposal. And by the way, we have access to all of those resources ourselves as theists, and we have infinitely more because we have God himself, a good and, and, and loving God who providentially orders the world and sustains it in its existence and made creatures in his image for a reason and for a purpose, and who loves us and who's imbued us with an eternal dignity and value and and purpose and make sense of authoritative moral obligations and the full rationality of the enterprise of morality and gives us grace sufficient to be forgiven and changed and transformed, perfected. Um, I mean, we've got all these resources. We can give robust explanations for the full range of things here. So on an abductivist account, I'm not at all committed to saying there's nothing plausible they can say with respect to morality. Uh, they can say some things that have a real measure of pl plausibility. I think an image I sometimes use is they can go a certain way down a, this path of explanation, but we can go much uh, farther, I think, as, as Christian theists. So we've got about 30 seconds. Let's see if we can get one last question and just get a very short response from both of you. From True ID Apologetics, his name is Adam Coleman. He's been on my show. He's awesome. He says, what are the best ways to leverage the moral argument in critiquing errant conceptions of God? For example, pantheism, Unitarianism. What are your thoughts? Any quick thoughts? I don't think you can leverage it against Unitarianism, but against pantheism, I think that our arguments would require a personal being to be the locus and source of moral values and duties. Uh, and I would encourage you all to read my friend Ronnie Campbell's book, Worldviews and the Problem of Evil. He takes on things like naturalism, pantheism, panentheism, and so forth. He's discussing a particular aspect of the moral evidence, in this case, the evidence of uh, evil and suffering in this world. And he argues that theism considerably better explains 
uh, the existence of this category than do these uh, alternate conceptions. And by the way, last plug, the moral argument isn't just about God's existence. It's all about who God is as well, uh, which is wonderful and is, is one of the most distinctively powerful aspects, it seems to me, of moral apologetics. Thank you guys for tuning in today. And until the next Capturing Christianity video, we will see you later.